at you from the Exodus headquarters in Ohio. Let's jump right into today's episode. All right, everyone, we are live with episode number 52 of Trail Cam Radio. And today we are covering four years of direct consumer, what we've learned, what we've experienced um, by running a direct consumer trail camera company, what we've been kind of seeing in the marketplace in various industries. And if you're looking to start a business or be a more educated shopper, this podcast should be pretty interesting. Um, coming at you a day late. It's always been Trail Camp Tuesday. Every 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 episode we've been on time besides this one, I think. Um, it's a decent track record. It is. And <laughs> not to make excuses. I'm not, ex- I'm not an excuse guy. But on the way out here, I was, I was scammed. <laughs> I was scammed hard. Uh, I was fearful for my life. No, <laughs> um, I was headed out here. I was on 294 uh, by Chicago. I pull off on an Oasis. I get gas, and I had to take a leak so bad. <laughs> so like I walk in, it was separated. So there's a restroom, or like the rest area with like all the restaurants, and then there was a gas station, and then the gas pump. So I walk into the gas pump. Right, I'm pumping my gas. I'm like, all right, I got to take a leak. I, I go into the gas station. There's nowhere to go pee. I'm like, oh, crap. So then I'm walk up, walking up. As I walk up, I hear a poomp, like my gas is getting full. And then all of a sudden, an SUV rolls up, and then a, a blacked-out Porsche SUV <laughs> behind that one. And the guy rolled down, uh, a fella rolls down his window and says, hey, I need help. Uh, I'm from Dubai, <laughs> and uh, I don't have any money. Can, do you have any spare dollars? And I was like, and I just got done listening to Joe Rogan and they're talking about uh, like doing the right reason just because like, it, you know, just doing the right thing, you know, putting positive uh, influence back into the earth. And I was like, all right, yeah. I, I, I had 20 bucks cash. I never carry cash. I was like, <laughs> I went to, I remember getting cash back at some point. I was like, I'm, I might need 20 bucks, whatever. And I had 20 bucks cash. I pull it out and I hand it to him. And he goes, oh, thank you. And there was a kid in there too. And the kid's thanking me, like, oh, thank you so much, thank you. And it's like, all right, cool, like, you know, I feel pretty good. And he's like, uh, I give you this gold ring, I'm from I'm from Dubai, uh, I give you this ring as a thank you. And I'm like, I was like, no, I can't accept that, like, no, thank you, like, just take the money. Mm-hmm. He goes, no, 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 please take it. And I'm like, I understand in that culture, like, if if they present you a gift, <laughs> in a in a true in a true scenario, like, you're supposed to accept it. So I was like, culturally knowing that, I was like, all so right. So, like, that's running through your head yeah. as as you've – decline the offer the first time and he's yeah. insisting that's yeah. going through your as head as he like, takes off the ring off his finger and he's like this is a uh, uh, 18 karat 700 dollar gold ring you can have it and i was like and i declined and he's like all right so i was like all right thank you and he's like do you as soon as i took he says do you have any more cash <laughs> can you go to the atm it's a 700 hundred dollar ring can you give me 20 more dollars i was like no dude i just gave you 20 bucks like you can have your ring i didn't like we didn't need to make this transactional like i was just giving you 20 bucks so at this point now it's <laughs> It well, feels awkward. Very on awkward. Your end. Yeah, and it's like one of those experiences, like kind of out of body. Like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> well, it seems pretty weird. And so it's like the Joe Rogan episode still playing back in your mind. Thinking, it's not right now. Like I'm, like I'm, I'm kind of on full alert. Like, why is this guy giving me a seven hundred dollar ring for no reason? I'm like looking at the Porsche, like making <laughs> sure like nothing crazy's gonna happen. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I took it, and then I, I called you. I was like, hey, if I get, <laughs> if I get axed on the way here, um. That's what happened. And then, like, right. as soon as I hung up the phone, like, that was that was too orchestrated. Like, and I Googled it. As soon as I Googled it, it was like, I Googled gold ring scam. <laughs> and, like, there was a ton of stuff that popped up. <laughs> and I was like, I got – I've been had. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I uh, – after that conversation, was that was – that, that was Monday, right? Yeah, was it was Monday. Monday or yeah. Sunday. I can't remember. Um, I laughed so hard. Like, <laughs> and then, like, a couple <laughs> minutes later, you sent me the text, or, like, the screenshot of the, of the Google search and – uh, the list of scams and like the ring being in the actual like, list. The actual, well, well, talk about that. Like what the ring looked yeah. like and then actually what came up on the Google search. Yeah. Like the images. So I Googled it and I was like, all right, I cannot be the only person this happened to. Like this is too weird. And I Googled it and it's like a pretty generic quote unquote gold ring. It has 18 carats stamped inside, uh, which when he took it off, he made a point to show like 18 carats. <laughs> and um, so I Google it and I'm like, all right, and as I pull it up, it is the same exact ring on the website, and they also had a gold chain that they've used as well. So it's like Scam 101 kit that you buy from like AliExpress. Yeah. yeah, you probably buy it on the dark web, and you get a nice little kit, and like, here's the sales script. Yeah. <laughs> go find fam- a fake family to go do it with. And uh, 
Well, hopefully, I mean, hopefully, if someone else, if this ever happens to you, either don't give him money. <laughs> Jack the guy in the face <laughs> right. for Jake. And he had a gold chain, too, so, like, I'm sure he probably said, oh, I only have $20, and he probably went to everyone else around there mm-hmm. and said, uh, I just had $20, I gave away a gold ring, and mm-hmm. I have a necklace, I'll give it to you for 50 bucks, you know? And I could just picture, and I was in a pretty nice area, like, as I'm going through, like, I was like, all right, maybe he's going to O'Hare National Airport or Midway, like, I mean, pretty easy to rationalize that, and then... I'm thinking like, well, what if some like old lady is like, I'll give you 700 for it if it's worth 700. Like, there has to be like that unicorn on their end, like, you know that, you know they make a a big buck from someone, right, and, right, instead of peddling for 20 bucks. But, you know, the the funny thing about that story is like, at the point where you're like looking over your shoulder because like paranoia has struck, yeah. right? Because I think like with your personality that. I think that sometimes you get in situations where like it makes you feel uneasy and that comes <laughs> over you because I can I, I remember <laughs> coming home from Harrisburg and we yes. were having trailer light issues on a trailer, right? Yeah. So we're on our way home from a ten day um a ten day consumer trade show. Actually we were probably there for twelve days, whatever, yep. you know, set up, tear down. And we're on Interstate eighty. We just fuel up at a sheets and getting ready for the long trek home, six hour drive home or you know, six hours back to Ohio and it was it just gotten dark, so it's like seven or eight o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And um, unbeknown to our knowledge, like we don't have trailer lights. Well, as soon as we pull out of that gas station, a steady flips his lights on, pulls us over. Um, you know, we go through the whole rundown. The the uh, the seven way plug for the trailer came unplugged and got drugged down the road. So at this point, we're sitting on Interstate 80 with no trailer lights. It's Sunday night at seven, eight o'clock. Like, where are we going to go find? a new plug and, and wiring and electrical tape and wing nuts and everything to get this thing back together. So, you know, the cops telling us, Hey, there's a truck stop down this way. There's tractor supply. He's like, you got to get off the road now. Like go up to the, I'll follow you up to the next exit. There's, there's um, an underpass there. You can park under the underpass. There's a little pull off. Like you'll be good. Mm -hmm. So as we get off the interstate, (laughs) it's like the heroin highway. (laughs) (laughs) As we get off the interstate, um, it's a super dark underpass, like on a gravel road. Uh, there's already a tractor trailer sitting there and a couple like really beat up suspect vehicle, shady looking vehicles there. Like this is an area like where, you know, drug dealers are going down, like whether it's Coke, whatever, pot, heroin. Yeah. Like there's some shady shit going on there. So <laughs> as we park underneath that underpass, <laughs> we drop the trailer not that big of a deal, you know, we dropped the trailer. We go get, uh, we found a tractor supply or something, found what we needed, came back. Now it's two hours later, so it's like 10 o'clock at night on Sunday evening. Like, no one, there shouldn't be anybody on a gravel road. Well, as we pull up to the trailer, there's there's a, uh, I think it was a Chevy Blazer, like a beat-up, rusted-out Chevy Blazer. Like, that comes creeping by. window. <laughs> yeah, like garbage bag or something, <laughs> yeah. like taped over the window comes on like i don't even think he had his lights on i think he strolled by like yeah. in his with his parking lights yeah. like like creeper mode in Str- neutral rolling essentially. yeah like <laughs> two miles an hour like strolling through there and then so they park kind of uh i guess we parked behind a tractor trailer and and this this suv or this blazer rolls up and parks in front of the tractor trailer in front of us so like they're ahead of us mm-hmm and I could just remember you, like, <laughs> pacing back and forth, like, looking around, like, making sure you had a flashlight on, like, Dude. checking out to see where yeah. they're going. And But then, like, five minutes later, another vehicle rolls up, and they're parked behind us. Yeah. So now, like, we're boxed in. Yeah. So now, like, I could see the worry, the like, Hell you yeah. being worried on your face, like, oh, shit, we're about to get jumped or uh-huh. held at gunpoint or something's going to happen. So now, like, I'm running scenarios through my mind, like, all the years I spent on the road and, like, the shady shit that's happened to me. Like, uh-huh. I'm like, all right, well. I have a knife. I have, you know, a screwdriver. Hide I got the cash box. <laughs> yeah, like hide the cash box. Uh, you know, we had like whatever six, seven, eight thousand yeah. dollars on us. Uh huh. Um, so now, like, <laughs> I'm starting not get paranoid, but like play scenarios through my mind. Like, okay, if this happens, I'm gonna do this. And uh-huh. like, luckily, nothing, nothing happened. happened. We got the trailer fixed. Kind of semi fixed. So we had we made it back. We had hazard lights. I think uh-huh. it's the only thing that came on. But it's random. We made the trip home without getting pulled well, over. Well, one so. of one of those vehicles when they were pinned, like he went in reverse and drove by in reverse. Yeah, too. Like, yeah. What is going on? Yeah. So that same exact feeling uh, as I was, you know, getting panhandled for twenty bucks. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny stuff, man. Um, yeah, 
it's a common <clears throat> everything I saw it was like California mainly. Uh, there was some happening in Austin, Texas, and I guess it's made it up to Chicago. So, so be on the lookout if you are in the major <laughs> if, city. If it's too good to be true, it is. That's it's oh, every time that's happened to me. <laughs> Anything that's too good to be true, it probably, it probably is. Which I was gonna give the guy money anyways, right. but oh well. Yeah. Um, I think it was probably the events leading up to like. You know, oh yeah, usually I'd say like, episode, like usually I'd say like get lost. By yeah. You, but <laughs> your mindset was right. <laughs> yeah. You were right for the taking. Yeah, I was primed up. Um, speaking of road trips. We made a road trip to Wisconsin. Uh-huh. You took – we actually took – both took like three days to travel, a uh-huh. lot, of, lot of work, a lot uh-huh. of pre-planning, and we recorded some interviews. Bunch of interviews. Uh, Bunch of podcasts. Heavy, like awesome, like really informative stuff. Yeah. Um, this actually pisses me off a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> really informative stuff, and one of them was with Dan Infall, and you had some, you had some chew in, and, and, yeah. you, were, and you were spitting – and that whole conversation on that that video, there's some like good video, but or like I was bla- <laughs> basically I was put on blast by 50 percent of the people that have viewed that video on YouTube. But going back prior to that, the same thing happened with an interview with Cody DeQuisto and mm-hmm. somebody else while we were at Harrisburg, mm-hmm. and it's also happened when we took the time to drive to Iowa, interviewed Don Higgins. Yeah. So it's happened like it's not only the 10 hour trip. In to Wisconsin, it happened, you know, on the 12-hour trip to Iowa. Each way, to add that. Yeah, it happened when we were waking up at 4 a.m., where I was getting up at 4 a.m. before Harrisburg, before 12-hour trade yeah. show day, to get work done, before the trade show started, yeah. to provide the content mm-hmm. and all this stuff that we do for free. Yeah. And it pisses me off that people, like, that it offends people. <laughs> I get it's a it's a dirty disgusting habit like i don't do it in front of my kids i don't want my i don't want my kids to do it um if i could go back 20 years i would never started but i like it <laughs> like i'll be truthful like i like it i like doing it when i when, when i drive i like doing it when i'm in front of the computer working i like doing it when i'm hanging out with my friends like in the rodeo scene um you know the construction scene like basically <laughs> the, you know if you don't it's bad for now this is the like this is the dichotomy here because it's probably a bad perception of the brand to have like a figurehead do that on video. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like I'm sacrificing time away from my family and things that are really really important to do some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. That we don't like this podcast, like all the stuff we're doing on YouTube. Like it's not a sales pitch it's, for Exodus. Mm-hmm. It's not like we're not. We're not we're not blasting you with sponsors. Like we do all this stuff for free and we're giving up time away from things that are really important to provide value mm-hmm. to basically help people. Whether it's trail cameras, white tail tactics, whatever it is. I don't see anybody else driving ten hours to go interview Dan Dan Infall and put it on, on YouTube. Yeah, there's a bunch of podcasts out there, there's mm-hmm. a bunch of his stuff out there, but name 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 another person or company that's that's doing what we're doing. I can't name another company and it certainly not name another person like these aren't these aren't like oh we'll be there no uh, so we'll link up it's no. like a dedicated trip uh just to help out the community in our way and you know if there's some if, if which there's costs money it's money yeah. and time like yeah. it's there's money in travel Most there's money away from time. the office yeah because it's like it is time operating a business as well and this is kind of a yeah a side project that we've done just to provide value to the community because we wanted to do it like this is something we yeah. wanted to do so uh, I, mean <laughs> I guess the, the moral of the story is like right now, like I spit a chew out before we started this podcast. Which, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's nothing in my mouth. The spit cup is out of frame. Um, I'm gonna make somewhat of a conscious effort not to do it on film. So it is what it is. But if you're around me during deer camp, campfire, if we're drinking beer, like whatever, just hanging out. Like, if that offends you, then you probably don't want to hang out with me. Fair enough. We'll leave it at that. And if for everyone that watched it and didn't complain, thank you for just enjoying yes, the content. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, pretty long intro, so let's let's dive right into it now. So we are talking about four years of being direct-to-consumer, consumer-direct, what we wish we knew before starting, and what we've learned up to this point. I think uh, it's 
it's a pretty interesting topic, and there's a lot of businesses that have just absolutely exploded over the last, mm -hmm. uh, you could say, seven years now. Right. Um, and it's, it, I still don't think, you know, I don't think the gold rush is over per se. Mm -hmm. I think there's still going to be brands that pop up and just absolutely yep. take charge of a product category that has, right. you know, been held by like a Johnson & Johnson company or something like right. that. Right. Um, so, I mean, let's just dive into kind of how Exodus was started with, Mm -hmm. honestly, a lot of the same principles as these other uh, direct-to-consumer product companies that maybe have a more narrow niche than uh, like shaving or something right. like that. Well, I think, you know, when we fell into, and that's, I'm going to say, fell into um, the direct-to-consumer business model, it, wa it, you know, it wasn't solely with the purpose of being consumer direct because we were looking at other companies. Mm -hmm. Um if we were smart, that's what we would have done. We would have recognized the disruption that some of these companies have caused in their mm -hmm. in their marketplace and said, "Hey, no one is doing this in the trail camera industry. Like this is this is what we need to follow. Like mm -hmm. let's follow their the the road that they paved." Um, but that wasn't the case when we started Exodus. Um, you know, the main focus of what we were trying to do was one solve um, the longevity problem. Like that was mm -hmm. the big big priority, and the second thing was. Um, serving customers and offering a higher level of customer support and product support. So mm -hmm. that was understanding the products, how they worked on a technical level and how to communicate that to our customers and be readily available um, when people have questions or problems. So those were like the, the, the two main focuses. So as we were going through development, noting those things um, and starting to build a bill of materials on that first product or camera that we built we were looking at the marketplace saying okay this is what we think we could sell the camera for and mm -hmm. it ended up being a 50 percent you know 50 percent margin so 100 hundred dollar product we sell it for 200 dollars. like we we use that uh, scenario or example a lot mm -hmm. so um yeah so taking that bill of material and looking at what we thought we could retail the product for we just simply told ourselves, hey, we don't have margins to sell to a box store because they're going to take 35 to 45, 50%. Like, mm -hmm. If we do that, like, we net zero. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, well, that's not an option. So let's just try to build a website and sell them <laughs> on our own. Right. <laughs> it's basically, I mean, that was a thought process. I mean, after we realized that, it kind of opened our eyes. But we were already... I don't know, six months into development, seven months. Like hey, we had a company formed. Mm -hmm. We had money going out. Uh, we had investment in tooling. Um, you know, we were not far away from, you know, actually launching. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just, you know, that's when we found Kuyu. Like that's when we found like the Jason Harrison story of Sitka mm -hmm. and then him leaving Sitka and then going to Kuyu. And the reason behind it, I was like, we, I shouldn't say I, but Matt, Steve and I, like, hey, like this is the same, like this is the same story of us. It's mm -hmm. just in a different niche inside the hunting industry. So then, like when we realized they were doing it, we started looking at other companies mm -hmm. across different marketplaces, and there was a, there were a ton of companies that that were doing it. Um, and obviously, the access to the web is what makes this business model so appealing. Mm -hmm. um, people, since you know, one people are spending more time on the web, they're more connected. There's more information, um, you know, all of that. So that's really how, I mean, it kind of, I don't want to say it happened by accident, but it did. It, it, it kind of did happen by accident. It wasn't, you know, we didn't have that business model laid out prior to development. It mm -hmm. was development. We knew the problems we wanted to solve. And then we looked at that and said, well, if we charge any more than this, we don't think people will buy it mm -hmm. because the trail camera industry is a race to the bottom. Well, yeah. we, we went the other way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some of it, uh, I guess, destined for the stars. I don't. I mean, I think that probably happens quite a bit. Where, I mean, really, in anything, and you're like, you feel like you're, you're a true pioneer, and then like after you take, <laughs> after you take <laughs> ten minutes to Google something, like, oh, this has been done a hundred times, right. <laughs> and and to use that to your advantage and say like, uh, how, what did they do? What do I like what they did? Mm -hmm. What can I? What can we do? But you know, better, or different. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of funny how that kind of transpired. And, right. um, yeah, if you were, if <laughs> there's so many times, like if you could just jump in a time machine, like do things over, yeah, yeah, you do, you do it so much better. But unfortunately those are the, the dues you have to pay, 
when learning how to do business and grow a business, 100%. you have to figure out those mistakes on your own because yeah. anyone that it's like anything, anyone that has to do the work and starts from nothing or starts from zero, it's uh it's a, it's, it's darn hard. And you're truly talented in that, you know, that endeavor. And I think you could repeat it from then mm -hmm. versus, you know, wanting someone to hold your hand the whole time. Cause you're never going to, you know, then you're basically just an employee or, you know, right. you're, you're parodying whatever, you know, whatever you're being told to do. So, yeah. And that was, again, like hindsight's twenty twenty, and just about everything that you do. But having some type of guidance when we started this company is probably something <laughs> we should have yeah. went and seeked out because, yes, you know, I had some business owners in my family, uh, father, grandfather, um, father-in-law. You know, Matt had, you know, his dad and some, uh, you know, some business owners in, on his side too. But it was all <laughs> – service-based stuff yeah. it was a, a you know trucking company it was construction companies it was telecom companies um engineering and design companies there was like no one in my family even <laughs> they barely have an email address like uh -huh. they, they they're never i mean they don't use the web for anything they don't know anything about product development they don't know anything about marketing like this is all stuff that we had to teach ourselves and as you said like there were a there were a shit ton of mistakes that we made you know the the first few years mm -hmm. which at which is not yeah. it's not isolated to what yeah. we're doing like well, that yeah, happens everywhere yeah that's not unique right. um and those are the most expensive lessons sometimes or or yeah. sometimes they're cheap lessons when you when you figure something out so um i think it's been kind of cool to see exodus take foot as you know being a true direct to cons you know direct to consumer trail camera company mm -hmm. i know there's like some that are like half you know half in the toe type deal but yeah. I mean, we've stayed through that. Yeah. Yeah. Omni channel. I, I think, you know, the big thing that we, we touched on this when we uh, were with um, Kate and the boys from Maven mm -hmm. is that as long as the, as long as the DT, DTC companies are, you know, remaining true to mm -hmm. the companies before them, I, I, you know, I think that the value prop is there for everyone. Yeah. But when companies start to stretch, you know, stretch their margins and then they play with that omni channel, mm -hmm. um, omni omni channel uh business model then i think that diminishes what you know direct to consumer really is and the value that it provides yeah that could that could damage it. and i think as popular as it's gotten it's been almost a buzzword to some degree mm -hmm. uh as as consumers get more educated on it and they're like oh well are you guys direct to consumer and they're like mm -hmm. it's just kind of a, a marketing buzzword but yeah for the companies that are you know their true mission was to solve an issue with a premium product and keep those margins, that 50% net margins, then, I mean, that's a true direct-to-consumer control camera company. Right. Um, let's dive into some of the major the, like the major pain points of being consumer direct that that we've experienced. I know, like, in the age of, of – everyone is an expert when it comes to digital marketing in this, in this day and age. But when the rubber meets the road and you have to get conversions, it's like when a lot of people start <laughs> – it's like when a lot of flies start dropping. <laughs> like 99% of them. Yeah. And that's that's been my biggest thing. It's like there's days where it's like, oh, it'd be so nice for someone to, you know, top level marketing where we educate them on the product, find us at your local retailer. The retailer goes in. Um, Joe Smith is working the store. Oh, it's great. And mm -hmm. then he takes it home. And then if he has a problem, he calls the store. <laughs> and the store tells him oh, to yeah. call the company. Like it's so much more hands off, which – Sometimes feels like a benefit, but at the end of the day, for the consumer, it's better to be direct um, in a lot of ways, and even the business to own the relationship. But to rely on a company doing forty percent of your revenue <laughs> with big orders, mm -hmm. that would be pretty nice some days. But it's also a major risk, just like anything. But I, th you know, there would it be nice to <laughs> to have a you know a forty thousand unit purchase order. Like, yeah, it'd be great to cash that check. Like, mm -hmm. But is it the best thing for what we're doing? No. Absolutely not. No. And that's where you just have to stay true to the core mission. And that's... It's hard to do. Like, yeah. when people are waving, like, large amounts of money in your face, there's not a lot of people that can say no or say mm -hmm. stick to that, that mm -hmm. path. Like, we get... And we're slightly off topic here, but we get email inquiries daily about resellers or retail programs. Mm-hmm. Every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we say <laughs> no. No. 
And it, some of those, I think, would I wouldn't say necessarily be a good fit, but I bet they would sell some cameras. I think. Yeah, hundred um, percent. But that's not what we're about, and that's. It's. <laughs> I've a, uh, I'm a little bit off topic, bit of a bit of a Dave Ramsey fan, and mm-hmm. he's like old fashioned, like even how he runs his business, it's yeah. like Envelopes. slow and steady. Well, like slow and steady, like. Uh, he's 100% against borrowing money. But anyways, like, uh, just looking at how his values are of taking the slow, steady route. And, you know, there's always the outliers of people who find success. Like Dollar Shave Club, I'm sure we're going to talk about them later. They were doing $200 million a year in 2016, and they weren't making any money. Like, yeah. to me, that's insane. I mean, it ended out positive, but they're the unicorn. And someone who is trying to leverage debt, like even in the personal life, that, that's – it could work out like if you have you know if you're overextended on a, a bunch of different real estate properties but there's a lot of perceived risk of that as well mm-hmm. um to where just like slow and steady is probably gonna win the race well the facts i mean the facts of owning a business are the majority of them are gonna fail mm-hmm. period that's the stat i mean that's yeah i don't know what the numbers are off the top of my head but like inside of two years inside of five years inside of seven years yeah if you can make like, it past seven you're a you're an extreme minority yeah Probably, I would, I'd guess like under 10% make it past seven years. Probably. Um, so when you're in the trenches and you're starting from zero, zero dollars in sales to getting to seven years, it's not easy. Zero customers, you know, zero authority in the space at the time. Like mm-hmm. it is a long journey that you have to be very intentional on what you're doing because it's, I mean, that's just. I'll be I, like, I'll be truthful. Um, I just now feel like we are really starting to hit our stride like in mm-hmm. the, I think we made a lot of progress in the last 12 to 18 months and like we're just starting to gain real momentum mm-hmm. which hopefully on the bell curve <laughs> you know like very young oh, on, yeah. that, on that bell curve yeah. but I would agree like for the longest time even like <laughs> friends and family they're like what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> and like now it's changing to like Hey, when are those new cameras come? <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're slowly transitioning into customers before they're like, uh, well, actually, one of my cousins said, like, go get a real job. Like, you're wasting your time. I was like, screw you. Like, what do you do? <laughs> so, um, he plays Xbox in his basement. <laughs> well, he has, a, it's a, a cousin in law. Like, he has a master, like, he's, he's pretty successful. But, like, yeah. my thought is, like, well, I had a really good offer and then I, I took this one and he's like, you made a wrong decision. I was like, who do who you to say? Like, you're still paying off your student loans. <laughs> 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 but um, that's where I, I hate to say it, but I, to, some, some, to some sense, like, my, I, I, your identity gets wrapped up into the business. Like, if the business fails, like, you feel like you fail. If the business does well, it like, feels like you're doing well. Yeah. And I think for small business owners, uh, there probably isn't anything more true to that. Yeah, it's very hard to – detach and disengage like the emotional attachment you have to your company mm-hmm. um i think that's something probably all small business owners struggle with yeah and it's it's not easy but kind of just talking about direct consumer so there's a lot of different things so you look at um brand reputation some of these direct consumer business models or businesses have put a ton of effort on building a strong, like, you know, pinnacle brand, mm-hmm. very powerful name, powerful logo, slow, never run sales. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they must have, you know, that's their vision. And then you have other ones that are like, um, I'll just say Arctic. And they're like, ads are like price wars, 50% off. And mm-hmm. they're doing a ton of volume as well. Mm-hmm. So there's more than one way to do it. But here's, for example, Arctic, like they're solving the problem of people want to have you know, Yeti quality or, you know, Yeti style coolers, tumblers, but they don't necessarily want to spend that much money. Mm-hmm. And they're playing on that emotion of like, you know, say 50% and have the same thing, right. you know, quote unquote. Um, and that's where that's, that's been a major trend with, with direct consumer. I mean, so like, just like any business, there's, you can leverage brand reputation, long tail, or try to just, you know, be a very cash dependent business. I think uh, that, you know, going back to the hardships of, you know, starting a direct-to-consumer business, I think that depends on your or the businesses, um, the businesses' thoughts on financing, debt, mm-hmm. and really startup capital. Like mm-hmm. for us, like we started this <laughs> out of pocket. Like we started this with no money. Like yeah. we did everything ourselves. And that's what you have to. 
Right, but yeah. there's also like to your point, there's people who go pitch to a VC and raise or or raise money through an angel investor or whatever it is, raise seventy five million dollars, and then you know their first their first year they do I don't know sixty million dollars, but they've burned through seventy five, and mm-hmm. you know they're negative fifteen mm-hmm. million on a year, and trying to you know the rat race of yeah, and that's <laughs> I wouldn't feel as comfortable doing that. <laughs> like just no, I think. I think uh, for someone who's who's a very seasoned business, like if you do that for your birth, first business, oh. that's not gonna end well. No. So I think you have to, you know, learn how to do the fundamentals before you do something yes, like that. And have a proven map. Yeah, and then if you know if you do raise yeah. that money, but um, some of the beauties too of of being direct to consumer is we have freedom to market however we really want. We don't have to. We don't have to send our ads to a major retailer and then they put it through the catalog or like, you know, map pricing. We can do what we want. And another thing that I like is we handle all pre and post purchase relationships too. I think that's pretty cool. And that's one of the beauties of harnessing a community with, with a direct consumer brand. Mm -hmm. Um, Because you can have loyal customers if you treat them well, or you can have the exact opposite. There's a lot of struggles of being direct to consumer. Uh, The supply chain sometimes might be a little more uh, flimsy because you're not ordering as many quantities. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, it, it, there's a give and take and two sides of the coin on everything that we're mm-hmm. saying, but that's kind of what I've seen, you know, so far up to this point. And it's, there's even some brand like major brands like Nike or, uh, L'Oreal, like really heavy hitters that are transitioning into the D to C market, whether it's a, a different brand or a division of their company, mm-hmm. because to them, they had like, they have the manufacturing on lock, they have the cash. And to them, unfortunately, they see higher margins, mm-hmm. uh, not necessarily all the things that we see on, on how we want to handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all, I mean, that's all super, super valid, all valid points. Um, yeah. I don't well, really have any thoughts on that. I, I, I maybe sometimes research too much to a fault. <laughs> so, like, all these direct-to-consumer brands, eh, they have a couple things in common. And the largest, fastest growing, like Casper Mattress, Dollar Shave Club, Harry's, most of those start out with a single product mm-hmm. that solve a single issue. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those people come from success in business elsewhere, like Harry's, like co-branded with uh, or co-partnered with another person that had a successful direct-to-consumer business. Um, Casper was a team of five people who left uh, another company. Five, like, I'm sure, like, five just heavy hitters that are, like, one's a financial guru, like, one's right. awesome at sourcing products. And they did $200 million in the first two or $100 million in the first two years of selling one single product. Now I look at Exodus. <laughs> we started with one single product. We started to lift one, and it was to solve those, you know, specific issues. Um, we did not do $100 million. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but we still haven't done $100 million. <laughs> on, on a small scale, it's, you know, without even knowing, you guys followed that model. Right. Just, I mean, it's mainly because couldn't afford it was, to do it was cash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. C- couldn't do more projects. Right. But maybe that's a blessing in disguise by you know not getting too many excuses. Too many like uh, there's there's companies in this industry that that expanded oh, too quickly. Yeah. Awesome brand, powerful brand. Verge of bankruptcy. Yeah. yeah, and it's you know they overextended themselves. So that slow and steady race, it's it's easy to honestly like the keeping up with the Joneses is just as apparent in the business world, <laughs> like businesses, than it is uh, you know. In your in your personal life of, uh, you know, looking at other businesses, like oh, how do they afford that? Like, well, right. probably because they're leveraging, you know, a ton yeah. of debt. Yeah. Um. So just realizing that is a is a whole other thing as a consumer. Like, you know, it's a lot of smoke. Y- and yeah, glitz and glamour is. Yeah. You know, it, that's a, what a lot of it yeah. is. Yep. Um. So yeah, the the biggest thing is they just start with a single product, they solve a single issue, and most of those are to the masses, um, and that's where. A lot of these, like the Casper match, like the whole mattress industry is kind of interesting. Like obviously purples popped up. Yep. Um, there's a ton of that popped up since then. And they've all tried to f- kind of copy and follow Casper up to this point. But just to show that even if you're not the first one, you can still model off of them. Like Dollar Shave Club, I assume, was first. And then Harry's came later. Mm-hmm. And they're another powerful brand mm-hmm. that did $200 million in the first two years. So it's yeah. like. Well, I think it, I mean, obviously there's, regardless of what market you're in, there's only X amount of dollars to go around. But yeah. The, you know, the bigger the X is, the more opportunities there, mm-hmm. there is. I, you know, with what with what we do, people probably think the marketplace is bigger than what it is. Like, 
market's pretty damn small. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, we're in a, uh, for, you know, Exodus is in a unique situation. I feel like we're a unique brand. We brand very well. Um, we brand very big, um, but we're still a small company. Mm-hmm. To my knowledge, we are the only true consumer direct trail camera company, like with a DTC value prop, you know, following that roadmap mm-hmm. um, in the trail camera marketplace now. You know, Kuyu's doing it, Maven's doing it. So there's mm-hmm. other brands, you know, in the outdoor hunting space. But for trail cameras, I feel like we are the only we are the only true DTC company and mm-hmm. unique in the size and the way that we operate. Mm-hmm. I don't. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is the X is really small. Yeah. In the trail camera marketplace, is there room for more? Like it's a very competitive niche. Yeah. Like so you I'm see to. more and more Chinese companies coming in like it's changed the landscape of amazon which we've mm-hmm. talked about you see people white labeling um or private labeling products you know lab- you know branding themselves as as a hun- hunting brand mm-hmm. um but the value props not there yeah and the barrier to enter for the trail camera space is i mean 10 grand <laughs> yeah i mean yeah you can put your name on a product for ten thousand dollars like yeah you gotta be able to buy it which is a negative you know obviously that's that is a, a major weakness of, of this industry or, or space is that the barrier to enter is, is so low. So that is. Yeah. I mean, it's flooded with, flooded with competition, but that slow, steady growth, like people fall out every year. Like, well, and, and those people without them even realize, like those they don't companies, know what they're getting into. Well, those companies are also helping our value prop too. Like when they buy that product and they're out of business in 12 months. Yeah. And have a two year warranty and it's right. they're out of business in a year or, or breaks it's junk. And then as people, get more involved with trail cameras they're like i just want something that's good like i think that's the consumer behavior of a lot of people like they start out something oh i really like this i want something good now like yeah like golf clubs you go to walmart <laughs> you go to walmart you buy the golf walmart golf clubs and you're like this is really bad i need new clubs because <laughs> i'm bad yeah. and then like you buy new clubs like well i'm still bad <laughs> but no that's, that's just kind of oh, a, that's funny uh a, a side thought but um any we kind of cruise through most of this but I mean, is there is there anything that you want to kind of add to the thoughts of direct to consumer or, or what you've learned or with with the direct to consumer model? I mean, it, you just have to cherish your customers like unlike anyone else. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we've talked about the business model on and off mm-hmm. through the fifty episodes, fifty couple episodes that we've done. Um, so I think most people are familiar with the, the like the value prop that it should provide to consumers. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's just staying. Um, true to, you know, that priority list, you know, solving some type of problem and then handling customer support or product support on a next level that no one else is willing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And then at the end of the day, like, you are, like, as a small DTC company, you're responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. Like, you own every single minute of your day, regardless of it's good or bad, and... You know, we talked a little bit about being emotionally attached in a manner, but you got to be able to get away from that. You got to be able to detach, mm-hmm. evaluate the problem, situation, solve it. Not even solve it. You need to make a decision <laughs> whether it's right or wrong uh-huh. and just act on it. Um, you got to be able to move really fast, pivot really fast, and uh, yeah, just be willing to grind your face off. That's, I mean, that's it. A lot of hard work. No, I, hopefully there's some value to someone who maybe is like on the fence on how they want to start a business. And if this helps them <laughs> even get the right foot forward or even start the research in the right spot, then I think even if one person, yeah. uh, then I think it served its purpose and it was worth the time. So, yep. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's Velvet Fest. Head over to our website and check, check everything out on that. Uh, we have weekly grand prizes, uh, Velvet Fest prizes with every single camera order. And there's also prize cards with every single order. So we've gone full send on Velvet Fest. So be sure to take advantage of that if you're looking to get cameras for the upcoming year. And we'll be talking to you guys next Tuesday. One qu- real quick before we shut this off. We have some T-shirts. Mm. Um, let's, give some, let's, give something, let's give some away mm-hmm. to our listeners. Um, so podcast specific, like let's, let's give some away. This will come out. This is, today's what we're recording. This, uh, it's Wednesday morning. Will this go live today? Yeah, it'll go live here soon. So like in the next, the first people, the first how, however, how many, how many shirts you want to give away? The first X amount of people 
that show that they have written a review. So if you wrote a review back last year, yeah. we'll reward Send you. Send a screenshot. In your shirt size, if we, ha- if we have it size, yeah, which no, we, we should. Yeah, no, we have uh, – I think we only have a couple smalls. Like those red shirts that we don't sell. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple – we have boxes of them. Yeah. So, yeah, send a <coughs> screenshot of your review. It could be brand new or it could be an old one. And your shirt size, and we'll give you a shirt until we run out. Yeah, Just do it. All right, thanks, guys. We appreciate it.